Well, thank you. I'm uh, uh, Ted Ames, a refugee commercial fisherman, and uh, I do historical fisheries ecology as well. And uh, uh, Robin and I have split this into two pieces. I'm going to talk about uh, how the Gulf of Maine functions and uh, if and whether the sky is falling and Robin is going to share with you the sorts of things that we have been trying to get accomplished uh, through the Resource Center. And uh, uh, I think we've made a very good start in things, uh, but you'll be a better judge of that perhaps. Uh, this is about sustainability in coastal fisheries in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, so, first a brief outline of, of Gulf of Maine ecosystems, uh, then a short talk about climate change effects on various Gulf of Maine species, uh, and then a closer look at whales, lobsters, and fish. First though, a look at uh, Gulf of Maine circulation. And uh, if you look at this arrow here and the two green arrows uh, coming from uh, the Newfoundland shore is uh, the uh, uh, is the uh, Labrador current and a filament of that goes into the Gulf of Maine, makes a U-turn and you see a long arrow going up into the uh, Bay of Fundy and a second arrow uh, making a sharp right-hand turn going in uh, which is uh, Scotian shelf water which is slightly warmer and slightly richer in nutrients than the Labrador current itself. Uh, it enters the Gulf of Maine and then um, as you can see, it forms a large gyre. Actually, there are two. The innermost one is called Maine Coastal Current, and it basically wheels around Jordan Basin, the eastern large basin in the Gulf of Maine, while the other continues on through uh, and exits the Gulf of Maine uh, via the Great South Channel uh, with a little filament going in to the north side of George's Bank and George's Bank is absolutely cool because it has a circular current pattern on itself. So uh, the tide comes and goes on George's uh, separately from all of the rest. It's really confusing if, you, uh, if you're not prepared for it. Um, Uh, next, uh, a peek at how uh, marine species exist in the Gulf of Maine. As you can see, I have this very complex food web that uh, uh, certainly gives you the general idea which everyone gets today in 7th and 8th grade and has it repeated two or three times along the way. But the focal point here is that uh, all of these species are actually functioning within biological communities. And uh, uh, those communities varies in size and complexity depending on where they are located and the species that happen to be involved with it. In the Gulf of Maine, where uh, borderline between subarctic and, and uh, uh, slightly warmer, uh, so the uh, species variation we have here is less than it is farther south. Um, basically you have to keep in mind that uh, marine food webs are loosely coupled, which means that if you're big or aggressive, you eat anything that's smaller or less aggressive than you are. Sometimes if they're bigger, but uh, it makes for an interesting set of relationships because uh, there are relatively few species that are restricted to just one or two prey types. 
Uh, we'll see more on that a little later. Probably key to our whole Gulf of Maine system is uh, the functioning of coastal ecosystem uh, estuaries. They're nursery habitats for a wide range of species and uh, are visiting places for feeding for a great many more. Our whole shellfish industry is based on uh, those interactions in coastal estuaries. Um, but what's often not mentioned is the fact that uh, alewives and other anadromous species play an incredibly important role in how the system works. Um, they're a forage species and they do uh, they do uh, uh, live in the ocean most of the time, but they do come back and visit. And believe it or not, they can come back in numbers like that if given half a chance. And if you doubt it, go to Dana Scotter, or better yet, there are some streams right around here that are recently opened and their runs of Elwives are increasing. Uh, interesting stuff. Well, um, Elwives live at sea for virtually their en entire life except for uh, a brief period when they come inshore in the spring, swim up into the ponds and lakes that they have access to, uh, scoot back out and hang around for a couple more months, and by fall they're headed back uh, south and offshore. Uh, the valuable part for us along this section of the coast is that their juveniles, their young of year, stay all year long in the estuary, creating a credibly large um, biomass of prey in healthy systems. Um, our best estimate from the Damascotta River system is that each female produces about uh, well between uh, 1,700 and 2,800 fingerling alewives at the end of the season. Bottom line is, if every female alewife died, you would still be exporting uh, somewhere around seven times as much phosphorus and nitrogen compounds going back down the road. It's a great way to clean up lakes, but it's also has an incredibly valuable function along the coast. Uh, here's uh, some work I did earlier which was mapping historical cod population distribution and where they moved and where they went. The, uh, the red areas are, are where fishermen caught gravid cod, cod that had ripe eggs. And uh, as you can see, these are all close to shore, and the arrows are um, where young of your alewives migrate from. And uh, a more recent study I've been doing is that these spawning areas, I plotted 15 years of coastal trawl survey distribution for the location of young of your alewives and found they corresponded with many of them. They arrive in the fall, and uh, they co they they co-aggregate with uh, young of year herring, which they with who they stay with for the rest of the year. That's why the cod were there, but they weren't alone because the blue lined areas were the location of uh, movement patterns of haddock, and as you can see, this offshore species that's uh, commonly connected with George's Bank today actually was uh, just outside the harbor here and could be again if they keep leaving these rivers open and a few rational management ground rules. But notice that these particular groupings of cod and haddock are located with specific rivers. Another clue for how 
this system used to function. The neat part is, uh, when you plot the movement patterns of other species, you'll find that cod, haddock, had company. Uh, white hake and, and, uh, and pollock are the two major uh, gadids that were caught in the wild fishery back when they were around early in the last century. But uh, it indicates something else is going on. Number one, what is happening is the prey, the forage base in those, below those river systems, was attracting all kinds of predators. Uh, that was uh, a dinner bell for them each time, each season, uh, as these young of years showed up. And this part of the system is particularly unique because uh, adults and older juveniles boogie out of there every fall. The only lipid-rich prey that's left behind are those young of year. Uh, so if you look at it collectively, you can say all four of those commercial species, uh, along with alewife runs and the herring that uh, uh, frequent there, function as a single unit, as a subpopulation, if you will. Um, fascinating idea to think that uh, these aren't really pandemic populations that just swim everywhere and reproduce willy-nilly. It doesn't happen that way. It's just like here on land. It's a fascinating change. You look at this, this is like looking at cows in a pasture. They're there for the food. And uh, when the food's gone, there's no fish, nor is there reason for them to come back. And maybe that's part of why there's nothing there now. But enough of that. Let's see how some of Maine's valuable marine species is faring with this. Uh, first, another little talk about Gulf of Maine water temperatures. Climate change is happening. There is no question. Things are getting warmer. Uh, but the temperature isn't evenly distributed. The blue is cold, the red is hot. You can see that our half of the state, Penobscot Bay East, is still comparatively cool compared to the West. The other part is, is what's going on in the Labrador current uh, with Climate change, ice is melting. A lot of ice is melting. And just off the side here, where in between Greenland and Iceland, south of it, there was used to be a huge area where after ice had frozen and the salt water had become more concentrated and very cold, it sunk. It does sink, in fact and then runs downhill along the edge of the continental shelf and uh, the, uh, the uh, Scotian shelf water does much the same. Yeah? Yeah, I have a question. You know, I read frequently and hear frequently the statement that the Gulf of Maine is the body of water that's warming the fastest, one of the fastest warming bodies of water you know, on the planet. And so I'm looking at that temperature chart there, and it looks like the upper part toward the Bay of Fundy is what's really cool. And as you get further down toward um, Massachusetts, it's a lot warmer. So that seems like the generalization isn't really ac accurate, that some parts are getting much warmer and other parts are staying in a normal temperature range. That's true. But it's very tricky if you try to make it a one-dimensional system. You have surface water, intermediate water, and then a tongue of deep water. So it's more complex. But the reason for that this is happening is because 
This settlement area, south of Greenland and Labrador, or in Newfoundland, uh, uh, because of all of the melting ice, uh, it freshens the water. It's less saline than it was before, which means that it sinks more, uh, less rapidly. It's less dense. And because of that, not only does it sink less, uh, uh, less, not as fast, but it flows along the edge of the shelf more slowly. The Gulf Stream hasn't slowed down a bit. It keeps chugging right on through, and they meet uh, south of George's, and much the same thing is happening, but there's less cold salt water. And the end result is uh, it has to get warmer, and it is. And it will continue, and at some point, Gulf of Maine very possibly will be different. Some of us look at it another way and say, well, when you have that much extra melt water, the isthmus between New Brunswick and, and uh, uh, Nova Scotia will drown out at the head of the bay and we'll have an intrusion of the uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence coming into the, bay, into the Bay of Fundy. And that would be a whole new deck of cards. But that's looking too far into a crystal ball. Right now what we have is a system that's gradually warming. Faster than some of us would like. Costs of that. Well, one thing that's happening is Gulf of Maine plankton, the subarctic varieties, are moving farther east and farther north. Uh, the pandolin shrimp that's so tasty that we used to get in the winter, we don't see much anymore because uh, it's not cold enough. And uh, certain uh, varieties of, of uh, plankton, such as Calanus marchensis, uh, is, uh, is moving north as well. Well, that has serious ramifications because scientists have found that uh, part of the reason that right whales are moving north to Gulf of St. Lawrence, where they have not been common in the past, is because the area uh, near the mouth of the Bay of Fundy, where there used to be huge quantities of this Calanus species, uh, gather every summer they're no longer there, or I'm sorry, they are there in much smaller numbers. But there's plenty of them in Gulf of St. Lawrence, and that's where they went. Unfortunately, uh, Canadian fishermen haven't developed the strategies and techniques for avoiding them that we have down here. So it's a brand new ball game for them. Mussels, scallops, clams, all our shellfish are particularly fragile situation, partly because as we get more CO2 in the atmosphere, we get more in the water, and as it equilibrates, it turns the surface layers in particular slightly acidic. Well, uh, shellfish larvae cannot develop a shell uh, when the pH lowers, so they die. Um, it's uh, a problem that's going to be increasing. It's a minor one today in this coast. Uh, it's becoming more serious on the west coast. They have problems with the upwelling situation in Oregon, but uh, we already see a lot fewer mussels uh, settling out. Uh, that isn't all. Incidents of red tide are increasing because uh, the water is warmer and the water is less saline. Perfect conditions for growing a couple of varieties of um, uh, dinoflagellates that uh, like those conditions. <coughs> 
Lobsters, by contrast, are doing just fine, thank you. They're pretty tough critters to start with. They eat almost anything, sometimes more than you would even think. They can tolerate temperatures from anywhere from uh, 64, 68 degrees, and even for short periods, even as high as 70 degrees. Uh, larval lobsters, 68 degrees is like a shutoff. You go and see that temperature and your mortality rates skyrocket. But, hey, that's pretty warm. That gives these critters a lot of space. I have uh, an example of what's happening with lobsters, though, and I'm going to try to play it, no guarantee. If it does it, yes. Now notice this concentration down here in southern New England, uh, working progressively farther north, and then kind of stopping uh, at uh, 2010, 2014. Are those settlement or recruitment members? Those, those are, my guess is it's landings. Uh, but uh, what's happening is we can see an expanding range and a concentration uh, in the Gulf of Maine. Conditions are really ideal for lobsters today. Uh, there are a number of reasons for it. It's uh, the absence of many predators and uh, and uh, also, there's uh, as temperatures increase, the habitat that's available for surface water increases temperature. It basically expands the habitat that's available for settling fourth stage lobsters when they swim down. And if the temperature is right and the substrate is right, they'll stay. If it's not, they just bounce back up and keep swimming. So an expansion of range is happening for them. But let's go on. The plot thickens because lobster fishermen are still concerned. The center of the population, as you could see before, is constantly moving farther to the east and north. And quite frankly, fishermen are afraid they're going to keep right on moving out. I'm less that concerned, but uh, Eventually, things will change more, and I'll be eating words if I'm still kicking. Um, one thing you can be sure of is that things will change, and this is no different. So it depends on how rapidly this rate of change happens to slow down the Labrador current, which is our saving grace for the Gulf. The Gulf, you see, is really like a wash basin tipped on one side with a big crack. The cold water comes in on the crack. Uh, the other stuff just spills over the lip. But uh, it's all in all with change. It's a fragile system. Whoops. That went the wrong way. Let's try this. There. Cod, my old buddy. Um, they're not as lucky as the as uh, the lobsters. Uh, yet, if you examine the conditions that they do well at, they're very similar to lobsters. They should and could be, one might say, as abundant as the others. But they collapsed back in 1995 and they have not recovered, period. That's incredible. Conditions, and they're not alone. There hasn't been a haddock caught up here in years that I'm aware of. White hake are virtually gone, and uh, so are um, so are the pollock. Though they're not, none of those are extinct. They are simply at such low numbers, it couldn't possibly support a fishery. Here's what it looked like in 2007 after an extensive Can uh, American and Canadian study that tagged 110,000 codfish. 
and retrieve tags for two, three years. No cod from basically the Kennebec River in the west all the way to Bay of Fun, uh, edge of Bay of Fundy and uh, the St. Croix River. Hmm. What's going on? Well, let's look at it a little closer in light of what we were talking about just a few minutes ago. Cod, haddock, pollock, the flounders, all of that stuff, even down to sculpins, disappeared in the two eastern subpopulations. Wow. And have never returned. At the same time, Atlantic herring were being overfished. They were targeting adult herring. Uh, midwater trawling was underway well and by then. And LYs were and still are in a depleted state. You don't suppose the absence of forage in those, uh, near those rivers, could have possibly been a contributor to this. Some of us think, yes, uh, partly because we didn't look at it as uh, a series of these subunits. Uh, incidentally, there are four of them between... Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Uh, there are four between Cape Ann or Gloucester and the Bay of Fundy. And we've, we're looking at two of them completely wiped out and a third that's well on its last legs. Interesting. Well, what's the story here? In the past, federal policy assumed that fish were lived in pandemic populations. They went anywhere and spawned anywhere. It's like a bathtub. If you put cake coloring in and stir it, pull the plug in the bottom and drain some out, the color of the water is just the same. Uh, they assume that cod and haddock and pollock and all of these other guys, they would just go and spawn somewhere else. Uh, they would find other nursery grounds and life would go on wonderfully. That's not how the system exists. Uh, we found that they exist in relatively small, independent, reproductive population units whose population varies independently of each other. So you could wipe one system out and you'd lose all of those cod and pollock and haddock, etc. But everything else would keep on going. They weren't aware that the system was more complex than that. They weren't aware that coastal subpopulations of cod and many other species were linked to these coastal estuaries and rivers. They weren't aware that a subpopulation was part of an ecological was an ecological subunit that had several subpopulations of different species that were connected to that estuary and river system. Uh, they weren't aware that these smaller ecological subunits were actually the building blocks for fish populations in the Gulf of Maine. Or that they all were part of a larger complex adaptive system, which means that when you change one thing in it, everything else has to accommodate it and change somehow. And we're seeing part of the tail end of that. As uh, they'd say in the old country, that's one hell of a mess. And uh, by gory, they're right. And uh, to uh, bring you on to what we're trying to do collectively as an industry and, and uh, managers as well, here's my dear wife, Robin. 
good evening. It's so nice to see all of you, and it's amazing to be here on this property. I, I, um, the summer of '72, I lived at the Coleman's um, long before Elliot had interns or anything. I was camping on his property, and we used to come and eat at the old nearing farm um, often with with Helen and Scott. So it's very nice to be here and and thinking about the uh, things that they believed in. Um, I'm wondering if we could move this closer so that it wasn't off the... Is that asking for trouble? Does that get it off? You never know. <laughs> So um, uh, I'm going to add humans to the <laughs> to this conversation, which is not going to make it any simpler. Um, uh, and Ted has talked about the limitations of traditional fisheries management. Um, it as it has been taught in universities for 40 or 50 years, um, as it has been put into law in the fed federal management law, the 200 mile limit law that's now that called the Sustainable Fisheries Act. And probably if any of you have been part of ocean nonprofits, um, as they have supported um, that, that approach. Um, but there is definitely change in the air and I don't just mean climate change. Um, <clears throat> there are major advances in science. Uh, Ted mentioned the local stock structure. What we've found is uh, people in the last 40 years have discovered that most marine organisms home to the place where they were hatched. That's true of little tiny reef fish in the middle of the Pacific going to the specific part of the reef where they hatched very much uh, very much closer to birds than we ever dreamt of in the ocean system. There are, um, <clears throat> so there are also really complex behaviors, mating, mating rituals and um, all kinds of things that were never known before people started diving and, and before we had GPS and before we could do the type of marine research that's been done recently. Um, and there's also genetics work being done. So for those of you who know where Gouldsboro Bay is just east of Ellsworth, it's a tiny 14 square mile um, air, uh, area bay. And the scallops in there are genetically distinct from the scallops outside the mouth of that harbor. So there is complexity. And, um, and as Ted said, prey matters a lot. And so add to that complexity, um, climate change uh, and the fact uh, and what you realize is in fact we don't just have a complicated system we have a complex adaptive system and that whole theory that it has been the root of developing computers and and it's it's a um, approach to complexity that um, that is being used in both social science and natural sciences um, this all makes a, a, a real moment in time right now. On top of this, we have a local opportunity, both a um, history of, of very different non-traditional management in Maine and also a pilot project. So I'm going to give you a quick primer on traditional fisheries management just so that you can, so that I'm not talking Greek. And then I'm going to tell you about the Eastern Maine Coastal Current Collaborative, um, if you can think about the Eastern Maine Coastal Current that Ted showed you, that inner gyre in the Gulf of Maine. And then I'm going to tell you the, um, about four types of management in Maine that are, uh, are really why I have hope that we might be able to develop a new paradigm for how to exist with fisheries. So. Um, so in traditional fisheries management, as Ted said, on average, there was assumed to be fish 
it was surveyed in large areas such as the whole Gulf of Maine, all the way from Gloucester to, um, to the Canadian line. Uh, they were counting adults of single species and um, there was an assumption that future stock size was tied to the current stock size. So in other words, the, the common sense, more moms make more babies, um, there was assumed to be a straight line connection. Um, and there was assumed to be an optimal level at which we can continue to take fish, adult fish, out of the population and we'll be able to fish forever. Well, it turns out to be a slightly more complicated. And I don't know why this keeps happening. Um, so what we've had is major conservation failures and cod in the Gulf of Maine is the poster child for that. But um, in many cases, the, the baseline's been moved and people are comparing it. Uh, you know, when they say there's success, it's really only the last, over the last 10 years, never look, looking at the type of historic abundance we should be able to try to restore. Um, fishermen have been granted fishing rights for large areas, let's say the whole Gulf of Maine from um, uh, Gloucester to Canada, and um, they are able to pulse fish moving around on abundance. And when you think about the local stock structure that Ted was talking about, you can see why you might end up with a serial depletion that you didn't, never even noticed if you were counting fish on a Gulf of Maine wide basis. The other thing that's happened is that rights to, f to those adult stocks have been given out like um, money in an in a economy. So people who caught the most have been given a share of those quotas and um, the idea was if they owned the shares they would take care of them. In fact what it's done is consolidated fishing into major ports like the white dots you see, Boston, Portland. Gloucester, New Bedford, um, and a lot of lo loss of local fishing communities. So I just have to give you a um, quickly explain how fisheries management is done. It's done um, inside three miles and outside three miles. Outside three miles, it's managed by the federal government. Inside, it's managed by the state, and sometimes by the state in um, partnership with the other states of the Atlantic coast. So it's kind of like a Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission is kind of like a UN of states. They get together, they decide how to manage, and then they go back home and they enforce the rules through their own state rules. So that <coughs> blue line along the shore is the three mile line. And you can see that the federal influence is huge in terms of territory. So um, change is tough and it usually doesn't happen easily and sometimes it's easiest to do change by trying something. And what one of the things that's happened since the 200 mile limit and the federal management went in in the mid 70s is the law is the law and you can't experiment. The the federal government has to say, we know how many fish there are out there. We'll tell you how much to catch. And if you catch only that many, everything will be fine. Well, they can't say, well, we really aren't sure how many there are. Maybe we should try this and then get some feedback and try something else. Well, we have a local pilot project that is, um, has been catalyzed by um, the fact that it's time to try something new like and because of the complexity that climate change is throwing at us. Um, and so the nonprofit that Ted and I started, Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries in Stonington, the state of Maine, the Maine Department of Marine Resources and, the, and NOAA Fisheries have signed a five-year agreement um, to take a look at the area swept by the eastern Maine coastal current because it is ecologically distinct. And uh, in the five years, the objective is to, um, to develop a research agenda that's going to support an ecological approach to fishing there. 
it's in the eastern Maine coastal current area, but it includes the watersheds that feed that coastline. So this is really radical to include land and water together. Um, Dr. John Hare is the um, head of the federal lab in Woods Hole, and he's uh, delivering a closing um, statement at the, a recent science conference we had in Machias, um, made these points, and I thought it was worthwhile mentioning them. Said, this isn't top down. It's owned by all three partners and uh, led by Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. That unlike the federal government, the way the federal government normally does it, it's not just the ocean. They are actually working um, collaboratively with other people who are working in estuaries and in the watersheds. There won't be one answer. In fact, he said two big traps. One is thinking there's an answer, and and the second is thinking it's too complicated, and saying not going to do it. And so um, this is he, um, this is the federal government saying this isn't going to be in our control. We're going to do this with the communities, and we're going to learn as we go. The answers and the right things to do are going to emerge, and they'll probably change because climate will change. And and this is just a major, major uh, development. So I thought I'd give you four reasons why we're in a good shape in Maine, particularly in eastern Maine, to, um, to take this different approach. If you'll remember that three mile limit, the state is not bound by the uh, Sustainable Fisheries Act and it actually has done a lot of very um, ad hoc and, and learn as you go kind of management over the years. Um, alewives, some of you may be aware of the exciting work that's being done on the Bagaduce watershed in Brooksville and Sedgwick and, and Penobscot. And um, alewives are, are, are complex because they involve watershed management, estuary management, and marine management. And um, so in Brooksville, there's a huge collaborative project that's been sparked by, um, in particular, Bailey Bowden, who's the guy with the shades in the, in the boat there, um, who's uh, <coughs> from Penobscot and has been dogged on wanting to restore alewives. And by uh, another couple of years, probably all the ponds on the watershed will be will have full access for the alewives. Um, so alewives take, um, alewife management takes uh, place. Um, it's led by states as a group because alewives um, exist all along the East Coast. And so Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission gets together and figures out what the rules should be. And then the states have to come back and, and enforce them. Well, how does that apply to the Bagaduce? Well, the way it applies to the Bagaduce is that there are, all, there are no rivers open on the East Coast except for a little over a dozen in Maine who have, which have traditional passage and harvest. In order to gain the right to harvest, you have to take scale samples for many years, uh, day in, day out, and uh, during the runs. And, um, and then you have to go through a process to get permission to harvest. Um, this is really difficult to do. Um, and um, in fact, none of the other states really have, have a concept that it would be possible to restore fish the way Maine is doing all along the coast. Um, so uh, volunteer stewardship is absolutely critical. And this kid who's looking at the fish in the, in the river is, this is what it's about. If any of you have, I hope you all have seen an alewife run because it is a primal experience and it makes you realize what the abundance of the earth, you know, what is possible. Um, so um, the, the team around uh, Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries and the Bagaduce watershed people are are making the case to Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission that, in fact, 
stewardship, I mean, harvest makes good stewardship. If the towns think that eventually they can harvest some of these alewives within the very strict limits that are set by the state and the interstate system, there will be more collective interest. And so that's where this is headed. And in fact, they have, re they have written the proposal that they're just submitting to the interstate um, group as we speak. This is a very pivotal time. It's all happening. The Bagadoos River watershed is really uh, sparking change on an Atlantic coast wide <coughs> level. Softshell clams is another um, case where um, one thing I didn't say about alewives is that the state doesn't manage it directly. They they subcontract it basically to the towns and um, to the operators of whatever person is is harvesting at a at a constriction in a stream. Softshell clams is the same way. Um, if you picture a clam flat with acres of of flats like Northern Bay and on the Bagadoos, and try to picture the state agency with 50 marine patrol officers being able to con uh, patrol those and a clam digger being able to run across a flat and get to another truck that's on the other point and the wardens on the other point, you know, the original point, you can see that it, local enforcement is absolutely essential. So um, this is a long-standing process that the state of Maine has done and these local town clam committees actually provide stewardship. They, they close and open flats, they do conservation closures, and they do local enforcement. So um, this is a case of quite, an, quite a local, quite an adaptive, um, quite a uh, human and resource um, linked management approach. Scallops. Um, about uh, starting in 2010, an effort, a multi-year effort was started to try to rebuild the state waters uh, scallop fishery. This was done by lots of meetings with lots of fishermen. Um, and what was developed was something that the state never expected. They had always managed scallops from Kittery to Eastport the same way. And what came out of the, those meetings was that there were three areas of the coast that were really different ecologically. And the scallops, um, the scallop abundance was different and um, the habitat was different. And um, for this middle part of the coast that we're talking about, the Eastern Maine Coastal Current Area, um, fishermen there wanted rotational closures. Fishermen drew those lines, those three colors of those areas those are rotational areas for scalloping. And, um, and uh, fishermen wanted to, to um, be able to fish from home and not have to be mobile. Back to the concept of not getting so big that you just pulse fish abundance, but they wanted to just a steady winter's, winter's work within reach of home. Um, they, uh, the state agreed and developed a process where there's some real-time connection with enforcement and um, that management uh, system has resulted in a major increase in value and, and landings. And uh, this, this, the success of this effort was part of what attracted uh, National Marine Fisheries Service to sign the ecosystem, the, uh, the um, coast, main coastal current ecosystem pilot project because they realized that interacting with people who knew the condition of the resource in their local bays and closing on a relatively real-time basis so that there was stuff left for the next year um, could in fact work. So lobster is the granddaddy of ecological approach to management. Um, there are no quotas. Although there's a survey done for lobsters, um, nobody ever limits the catch. And that's the fundamental thing for traditional fisheries management. Instead, protect reproduction by V-notch, not you know, throwing over egg-bearing lobsters, um, 
protecting juveniles by throwing over the little ones, um, protect habitat by fishing with traps only, no dragging for lobsters, and, um, and uh, limiting, limiting traps, limiting technology, and fisherman stewardship. Uh, fishermen, when we bring, you see, when I ran uh, Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries, we would have, uh, let's say, crab fishermen from Chesapeake Bay or fishermen from Belize come up, and they'd be shocked at how many fish. If you've ever been out lobstering, you fishermen are throwing over more than half of what they're catching often, different times of year. Um, so this is the other piece of lobster management that is so unique. There, there are um, seven zones. There, um, the zones limit the mobility of fishermen so that you're not entitled as a fisherman to catch lobsters wherever they are. You have to catch them near, nearby where you live. These were state proxies for the traditional territories, basically, is what they were. Um, if you will notice, Three mile limit is this line here. The zones go out to this line here, which looks a lot like that line over there. Um, and so what this is, is an agreement between the states and the federal government that state rules should lead with lobster. And, um, and in this area, the main type fishing rules, no dragging, all of that stuff goes out to about 25 miles to, that, to this line here. And what you'll see is even the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission um, has quite a complex number of areas south of, of us. And that's because the state agencies have said, well, we need to make this change off the Cape. We need to make this change in the um, south of the Cape, and, and um, so it has adapted, um, this management is adapted um, by fishermen and managers working together. And the federal government has agreed to this and has not put the traditional fisheries management on lobster, instead has let the states take the lead. The other piece for Maine is that we have co-management. Um, the zones have the right to vote on certain rules so that the trap limits or the time fishing or whatever can be different in different zones. Um, very important issue, it's owner operator throughout the state of Maine. And what this means is that the person who owns the boat is the only person who can lobster off of that. And um, when, when we had a conference Oh, back in 2010, and we brought fishermen, um, we brought fisheries managers and social scientists together from both coasts of the U.S. and Canada and asked one question. What's the most important thing for preserving community scale fishing? They all said owner operator. Um, so this is completely opposite to traditional fisheries management where the idea is it's efficient if you give rights, people can buy them, sell them if they consolidate it, and the person who owns the right is ashore and has a hired skipper, that's perfectly okay. This is, the guy on the boat is responsible for the, act, the conservation actions directly. Um, we have apprentice-based uh, entry as well. And the owner-operator is now considered so important in Maine that it's been extended by the legislature into Maine state scalloping and Maine urchin fishing. So the, the end result of this is that lobsters have been, the management of lobsters has positioned the close to 5,000 Maine lobstermen um, to take advantage and benefit from the ecological con uh, conditions that Ted mentioned. So you know, the reason we have more lobsters is undoubtedly because we have warming waters and extension of habitat and reduced predation. But the, um, but Maine fishermen and coastal communities have been able to benefit from that. Just think, if we'd had this 
pulse of moving abundance that you saw on Ted's map and you had the possibility of people who had caught the most getting the most right to lobsters, that pulse started down south of the Cape and offshore. It moved east. We would have had boats moving up the coast fishing and not and we would not have had the benefit of this um, so to come back to the collaborative um, we're calling it Eastern Maine uh, it's, we're calling it EM3C um, and I just wanted to say that there is a lot of science and social science that has, is backing up this change. And this pilot project is, a, is making one place in the, in the country where traditional fisheries management can be, we can try an alternative and get some feedback and maybe learn something. Um, Eleanor Ostrom, who some of you may be uh, familiar with, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics, um, studying irrigation systems around the world and studying the main lobster fishery said that um, co-management is essential. People who are using resources have to have responsibility for um, the management of those of those resources because otherwise you just don't have the, the right information flow and the right behavior. Um, complex adaptive systems says we have to learn as we go. And um, a, a very prominent social scientist said, this is the time to try bottom-up ecosystem-based fisheries management. I guess that's it. <laughs> Sorry, I thought that. So anyway, this is, uh, I thought I had one more slide. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right, so. Um, we found from Ted, Ecology Matters. Um, this is localized and place-based. Um, fishermen are going to be involved in the data collection, in the thinking through what's smart. Um, and the whole system isn't one solution that comes out in one day. It's a, it's a process of learning, making decisions, adapting, because we now know that change is happening. We always knew it, change happened, but we kind of could have assumed it away because we couldn't see it. And now the, the time horizon is so much uh, closer. So it is a tall order, but I think we don't have any option. And I think we're positioned here with kind of, it's a miracle to me that um, we can try this here. Thank you so much. <laughs>
uh, you have the same power. Neat. Yeah. I'm really glad I came tonight because this is much more positive than <laughs> you hear. Yeah. And so it's really great. Thank you. And and you know, I think what option do we have mm -hmm. but to try? Right. And and um it's been this has been a 40, 50 year process for both of us, watching things, taking a look at things and saying this does not make any sense. Just simply counting fish and telling people how much they can catch is not the only thing that's going on and all of a sudden all of these pieces are coming together. But governance, this is all about, you know, what I've been talking about is governance and heaven knows we all know that governance is very difficult. So I don't want to underestimate the challenge. I'm curious about the uh, alewives and how many are licensed to uh, harvest them? Because we know some who have had licenses and in a few short weeks they make thousands of dollars. So I'm going to do uh, Japan. I'm just curious. Those are elvers you're talking about. Elvers. Those are small eels. Yeah. Okay. And those two. How are those related to any of them? Not as not as close as one would hope. Okay. Uh, Lwines are are basically managed by the state, but controlled by the community where the river goes through. So uh, the Surrey Brook uh, has has rights to uh, lease out capture of those Lwines to one or several individuals. Uh, Elvers. Uh, the state lets them out, but they don't have an owner-operator arrangement with it. And to my knowledge, I think I, they do. They do. Yeah. I think they do. No, I think they. Do. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, but it's. <laughs> but. So those, for those of us who don't know much about either one, <laughs> what's an elder and what's an L one? Yeah, an L one. Okay. Oh. <laughs> So they're not related. No, no. Way. And Elver is no. a baby eel. Yeah, eels are the, yeah, know the, the black things that yeah. they go and swim out to the Sargasso Sea, spawn one time and die, and these little critters like this big swim all the way back up to all of these various lakes and rivers. And uh, that's what the fishery is for. Mm -hmm. Some and of us look at it and say, this is ecological suicide. It takes them anywhere from 12 to 20 years to mature. Mm -hmm. We don't even know what so forth and so on. But uh, it's they're doing it supposedly uh, by placing a quota on it mm -hmm. and controlling it. So I hope it works, but uh, some of us are a little skeptical that maybe they're catching them on the wrong end. So, so eels, my annual migration is the opposite of alewives. Alewives swim, uh, spawn in fresh water and live in the ocean. Eels spawn in the ocean and live in fresh water. So um, the babies go upstream for the eels, and for the alewives, they, it's like salmon. They're they're a, called a river herring. They look like an Atlantic herring, only slightly different body shape and whatever. And they um, um, and they go up, spawn in the lake, and then the adults go back down. It's not like a Pacific salmon that dies after it spawns. They'll do that three or four times. They're incredibly prolific. Uh, when the Penobscot free uh, uh, Western Europe interruptions uh, runs were estimated to be 25 million fish per year. That's uh, going up, and then when you think of how many babies uh, if, come down... It's if half of them were female, and multiply that by uh, 2 times 10 to the 3, you're getting to be a wicked amount, and that's not even counting the baby Atlantic herring, but they arrive by a different transport mechanism. So the prey base that I was showing you is probably just a fraction of what existed 
before uh, uh, before they reach that point. That database is 19, probably 1900 to 1920. So Let me just say point. one quick thing, then we got a question. Still species? So they're not endangered. They're not because uh, you know, they're my son lives right by the Walker Pond. Yep. And when they're running, they are so dense. I mean, it's incredible. It's like picture that you have. That picture was. And the, then you have all the predators all around. Yes. Like the eagles are yes. you see up in the trees, just yep. waiting like suddenly diving in. And there's just as many down the bay, and just as many you can't see up in the lake itself. But they are. That's their role in life. Is to be wise. To be right. yeah. <laughs> so you can harvest them. So, so this is what the the harvesting of alewives is only allowed on 14 rivers in Maine. All the other ones you can't, except for 25 fish. So, um, in order to get permission to harvest them, you have to um, collect scale samples for enough years, and you have to take scale samples three times a day the whole time they're running. And then you have to take scale samples while they're running down. Um, people doing that? Yes, and that's what the volunteer effort in Brooksville is doing. Mm -hmm. And on, um, what, five ponds on Parker, not yet, but Walker and White's and Pierce's right now, Frost and Parker are gonna come online in, in another couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so then, you, if, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission makes a decision to allow more rivers ever to be allowed because they've been so conservative they haven't been letting anyone harvest this um, the people from the Bagaduce watershed are with the help of Maine Center for Coastal Fishery are petitioning Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission to make a with the idea that if we can promise all these volunteers the fact that eventually there will be a harvest on these rivers, more people will have motivation to do it. When harvest is allowed, it will be given either to the town or to one operator, and they have very strict, they can only have it open during certain hours on three days a week. So it's very, very tightly they, controlled. They need to demonstrate that there are five year classes of hellwives returning to the stream. Uh, most streams can't because uh, in past years uh, uh, the, fish, the fishing person for the, that particular stream would be having a good year and he just fishes it every day and nothing gets up and voila, next, uh, uh, actually four years from then, nobody comes in or very few do. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the pitfall that they're they're uh, protecting against. Yeah. yeah, and you realize that the res restoration of these rivers throughout Maine and these small streams, this is rebuilding things that were stoppered up in the early 1800s, late 1700s, when 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 dam you know water power was was the way everything happened. So this is a this is restoring an ecosystem that's been damaged for a long time. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is a really general question and not a lot of business, but I look out uh, here at this, this beautiful water that you played outside of that window for and I have no idea really what's going on out there. And my question is, you know, like on a scale of one to ten, when you think about what was in those waters and the potential of what could be. Where are we now in terms of the health, the overall health of those waters? That we're Point oh, out there? oh, oh, three seven. Point zero three three. So it's almost a dead sea. <laughs> stop and when you stop and think, how many mackerel do you see swimming around? Mackerel, for what it's worth, today are are. Uh, are listed as overfished and overfishing is occurring, which means National Marine Fisheries Service is cutting them off. Uh, what about the heron that used to be so abundant? 
the latest survey by NOAA was that if you take the last four year classes, baby, baby uh, herring from age zero up to age four, and put them all together, they are less than the year five class because there's nobody left to reproduce. We are heading for at least a decade of really low level uh, herring uh, fisheries. What does that boil down to? Those are the two primary living rich prey sources for the northern Gulf of Maine. They're basically guaranteed that fin fish will not be restoring in these estuaries, except for those midwater trawlers that cleaned everything up have been absolutely faithful in avoiding L-wise because there's a directive because of the failed, the condition of L-wise south of Maine is so poor that environmentalists have threatened to file for endangered species status. And if that happens, that would uh, put the midwater trawlers out of business. So they, they've been very cautious that way. So we have a lobster-dominated mm -hmm. system right now, and that's not a healthy system. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been part of the um, Surrey Wildlife Community for a while, and we have a really <coughs> light run this year. Mm -hmm. And so we said, okay, that's because four years ago we had an even lighter mm -hmm. Is that, is that right thinking? I, mean, I, I think it's really right thinking to know that, there, to recognize that there's variability. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. That's why I didn't see any birds in the tree. I kept looking to, I was going to go down when I saw the birds and I never, yeah. I think so too. Yeah. And yeah. We did have a, we did lease our fishing rights in one year to um, a fisherman, and we didn't, we didn't do it. Right. He, you know, wasn't supposed to put anything on the attach it to the structure there, and he did. Mm -hmm. And they were just like, that's it, out. And so that was kind of too bad. Mm -hmm. he, I think he actually was a good fisherman. Yeah. But um, he'll be back, you know, and then we're ready. But I, I guess we haven't proven that we have a. Um, a, uh, a population quite yet. Right. That but that is, yeah. am I right in thinking that that is one that potentially does already have rights? I think so. I think it's one of the few, whereas <laughs> the Bagadoos, there aren't any that have rights mm -hmm. to fish. On, on the variability, uh, one doesn't realize, uh, looking at the stream, that the primary harvests for uh, small pelagics like uh, Atlantic herring and mackerel and so on, get these guys as a bycatch. Mm -hmm. And the design capacity for a typical stern uh, 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 pair trawling yep. uh, combination is a million pounds of fish per day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And last I knew there were uh, still 18 or 20 of them working the Gulf of Maine. And you do the arithmetic, and they've put in constrictions, uh, constraints in their efforts, but by, uh, by simply examining the survey of uh, what are the species they have been targeting, mackerel and herring. Uh, mackerel are overfished, and overfishing is occurring. They have been cut way back. Atlantic herring, uh, I just described to you the, how 
bad the reproductive component, the adult fish uh, component, is today. Uh, they, have, they have done the same thing that they did in, in West Africa. Mm -hmm. They have totally trashed the system, and now it's time for them to go to South America mm -hmm. or some one, other place. On the one of the things that's exciting about this focusing on Eastern Maine is that First of all, there's so much alewife restoration, so that's putting some forage species into the, <laughs> if they don't get caught by the midwater trawlers, but, um, and um, we know also that herring, Atlantic herring, sea herring spawning is in localized uh, beds. They too home to a localized spawning area. And um, so as the science for this ecosystem approach gets going, that's going to get fed into it. And it used to be that lobstermen would find herring spawn all over their traps. That hasn't happened for quite a while in the same, to the same degree. So that's one of those things that if you're talking about a small area and local people fishing an area who might eventually get rights to fish some of those other species, um, all of a sudden you have information coming, feedback loops, the ability to leave a herring spawning bed alone for a, a critical period of time, and all of that kind of um, behavior, which has just been impossible when you're managing at a Gulf of Maine wide scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So but then, <coughs> this is all down the road. It's not, <laughs> it's not done but, yet. But uh, where this all comes together is the subunits of of uh, ecological activity that's associated with these uh, these estuarine areas that have, particularly those that have a credible river coming into them. That's an internal dynamic that's going on right there. If you can eliminate just that and have everything else going around, uh, well around it, kind of suggests that it might be possible to regenerate that sub that suite of subpopulations, and have that uh, that that critical building block back functional again, and I think getting those prey species back in credible abundance locally is the key. What you guys are doing is right on point. It's really fun. Everybody should get volunteering goes to. <laughs> well, just seeing that stuff. Yeah. If we were out, uh, Menhaden, our Maine isn't allowed to catch very many Menhaden pogies. And uh, they come yeah. up every summer. Uh, usually not any, usually they stay on the west side of the Penobscot Bay, but this year they're up here. Yeah. And uh, I've seen them, they'll, unlike herring, they'll splash around on the surface. <laughs> and uh, they're around, and it's nice to see. Don't they die sometimes in incredible numbers? Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Like Brunswick. Yeah. Like yeah. Brunswick yeah. 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 And what causes uh, Usually bluefish, but any predator mm -hmm. will drive them. Oh, so they drive them in. And, and, and the I place know. where it's particularly hard luck with this is Munswick Bay. It's relatively shallow. And they, or is, is that the name? Munswick? I was thinking McCoy. McCoy Bay, yeah. 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 They run them in and then the tide goes oh. and they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> but again, you, we're not used to abundance. We're not used to the things that happen when you have abundance. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. But bluefish and stripers are the main villains. But I can remember when I was uh, a a boy fishing out of, a young man fishing out of Vinyl Haven, and I would uh, go hand lining when I, on my off days when I wasn't hauling traps. And uh, we didn't have squats for our electronics back then. And you would chase flocks of gulls and, and terns and everything else, mm -hmm. diving on uh, a pod of herring or alewives mm -hmm. or whatever. And we'd run over there because there were fish underneath, and usually they were pollock or cod. Uh, they weren't hake or haddock. 
uh, they don't come up in the water column. But it was very exciting to see so much light. And if you could see that uh, and create a system where lots of people could share it in one form or another, what a great improvement that would be. I'd love to see that stuff again. Mm -hmm. Dick, did you ever? I was wondering, uh, I'm hearing a major bait for lobster. Yes. The hearing of diminishing is never effective to attract lobster. It, it's a huge issue this, this summer and will be for the next summers and they're looking for other types of fish to bring in from other places. But I will say also, alewives are an excellent spring bait for, for lobster. But the, difference, but the difference is that uh, you can control extraction of alewives at the mouth of the, of the river. You can't handle it at all when they're dragging this stuff 20 miles offshore. So maybe that's an avenue that will work uh, to basically if we can get rid of this offshore effort or have it reduced to a point where it ceases to be doing what it is, uh, we can get it back. Um, it's crazy. Parker. Uh, by dragging, you mean nets for? Yeah. The midwater trawling is with yeah. nets, yeah. Is yeah. There, are there any studies or any groups of people that are addressing the impact of dragging, or say, scallops on what's happening to the environment? Um, Not right now. If you look at Maine's historical landings, you find that scallops uh, reappear about every 20 years. Uh, and uh, if you examine uh, the process, uh, I've looked at it on both sides, uh, the, the prime scallop grounds that were uh, used back in the 30s, uh, when I or my brother checked them out, uh, were boulders and wastelands with nothing on them. Uh, but there had been new settlement in other areas. And I'm looking at it and saying, there's a 20 year hiatus because they totally trashed the nursery grounds where uh, young scallops would settle. Because we well, still have and that's that's the other thing that's being talked about with the co-management of scallops right now. Just how to um, can you can you use that same setup over time to lighten up the drags or change? The dive, just diving is not necessarily the answer. And dive fisheries are you can't dive in all places where scallops are, and dive fisheries are really hard to control. If somebody wants to cheat. That's an easy way to cheat. So, so it's it's one of those things where this is where you got to pull people together with the idea of having scallops in an area for the long term and say, what is it that's going to make that happen? Let's sort this out rather than just I'm bigger than you or you know whatever all the things that happen in in power politics. Do we need to? <laughs> Thank you very much.